All right. So um, good morning to everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us in this uh, very short webinar on a Sunday morning for the World Microbiome uh, Day, which takes place on the 27th of June. So uh, this webinar is titled Microorganisms Are Allies, Microbial Biodiversity Preservation, Exploration and Valorization for a Sustainable Future. And this uh, webinar is organized by um, partners of the IS MIRI 21 project. We'll introduce it later on. Um, so we have a uh, University of uh, UNITO and um, UNITO University of uh, Torino, sorry, um, uh, which is Anna. And then uh, there is um, uh, Julia from INRA in France, uh, which is the national um, Sorry, I am admitting people. Thank you. Um, the National Research Institution um, for uh, Agriculture, Food and Environment. And there is I from um, SBI, Portugal, um, Portuguese uh, Society of Innovation. So I will go to the next slide. Right. So um, just a few housekeeping and disclaimer. Uh, rules. So the webinar, as you might have heard, is uh, already recorded and we will take screenshots. This is mostly for uh, reporting and press release. If you are not comfortable to be seen uh, in the recording or you, to be heard, please use either the chat and also do not um, switch on your video. And you, sh you can also let us know by chat or email uh, and we'll find a way to uh, obscure it. And uh, we also ask you to please post your questions um, if any come up during the presentations uh, and they will be addressed at the end uh, in the Q&A session. And we also please ask you to mute uh, during the presentation so that we don't have interruptions while uh, the speakers are presenting. And if you have any difficulties with Zoom, please let us know in the chat. So uh, the agenda is very uh, simple. Uh, the welcome and introduction is taking place right now, which will be followed by a short intro and a demo session, uh, a video to uh, entitled um, Microbiome and Microorganisms organisms for a sustainable world. And then we'll have a fun but simple quiz uh, after that, which will um, also have a bit of a discussion and followed by a presentation on cultural collections and their role in uh, microbial biodiversity, uh, preservation and exploration. And then we'll have a very short presentation of IS Miri and uh, Miri, uh, followed by Q&A and closing. So the aim of the, this webinar is first of all, to look at uh, culture collections. Sorry, uh, may I ask we all mute ourselves, thank you. Um, so uh, the aim of this webinar is to look at culture collections and how uh, they, what role they play in the preservation of microbial life and biodiversity and the sustainability of the environment. And it's also to inform how us as citizens can actually play uh, a, an important role in the sustainability of the world and present a showcase on how EU funded projects such as IS MIRI 21 are contributing to the RNI ecosystem in Europe and beyond. So speakers, we have Julia Celloni uh, from INRA. So um, and she is a microalgae ecophysiologist. And we have uh, Anna Poli from UNITO, um, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher, and uh, myself, Tidora, a project consultant from SPI. So um, now I will give the floor to Anna to give a very short introduction before we go to the demo session. Thank you. Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Tedora. Um, so uh, the video we will show you um, in a few minutes will bring you uh, into the uh, world of uh, microorganisms and uh, uh, will introduce the importance of the microbiome. Um, nowadays, uh, the word microbiome is very popular. If you uh, think of uh, uh, facial advertisement, for example, uh, telling you about uh, uh, the skin microbiome or uh, uh, yogurts commercial uh, uh, mentioning the gut microbiome. But uh, uh, really my, the microbiome and uh, microbes are everywhere. And uh, um, we will show you with this video how they can, help, they can come and help us in building a sustainable world. So 
let's start now with the micro with the video and uh, uh, let's see what the microbiome is. The genome of all the microbes living inside and outside an organism is a fine microbiome. The human microbiome is also known as second genome. Every anatomical site, including skin, gut, oral mucosa, glands, etc., has its own microbiome. We can say that human beings are colonized by microorganisms since, on the whole, 57% of the cells are microbial. Beside the human microbiome is the soil microbiome. Consider that one gram of soil can contain up to 100 million microorganisms. And the plant microbiome that is located in the aerial parts of a plant, in the rhizosphere and roots, in all these cases a good microbiome is beneficial to its own host. Microorganisms inhabit the oceans too. Herein, they are present either as single cells freely floating or as communities associated to vegetable substrates like algae or to organisms like corals and fishes. These communities make up the so-called marine microbiome that is still largely unexplored and that can also reside in the sand, in the sediments and in the water columns. Environmental and human microbiome are strictly connected. A person with a bad diet will have a fragile gut microbiome and consequently a fragile health. Likewise, a person eating fruits and vegetables derived from plants and soils with a poor microbiome will not nourish his her microbiome and will develop a fragile health. On the contrary, a person eating healthy food, rich in fruits and vegetables derived from plants and soils with a healthy microbiome, will strengthen his her microbiome, developing a good health. Have a look at what happened to corals with bad microbiomes. They are all dead. The same happens in soil with a bad microbiome. Nothing grows. A new microbiome has been recently discovered, the plastisphere or the microbial community capable of colonizing and growing on plastic. Plastic waste is literally suffocating our world. And as you can see in these pictures, also the oceans are dangerously full of it. The fact that microorganisms can grow and reproduce on plastics rudely abandoned in the environment means that they get nutrients from it. That is significant because it means a degradation of the plastic material is happening. Somebody will want to know who are the main actors that together build up a microbiome. Well, all the microbial categories are involved. Bacteria, microalgae, viruses, unicellular organisms or protozoa, filamentous fungi, and yeast. Now, a straightforward question will be, are all these microbes good or bad for us? We are used to consider them bad since we know them only for the diseases they cause. But this is not the whole truth. There are awful and malignant microbes, but also marvelous and fantastic ones. Let's get to know some of them. Among the worst bacteria, we can find the casual agent of flesh-eating disease, staph infection, meningitis, pneumonia, 
tuberculosis, cholera, and dysentery. There are diseases caused also by fungi and yeast. Fungi can affect the lungs, the brain, the nails, the oral cavity, and the guts. Bacteria causes diseases also in plants. They can damage strawberries and tomato plants and olive trees. Likewise, fungi are important plant pathogens. For example, they can affect grapes, cause race blasts on rice, or devastating wet diseases in many plant species. In addition, some bad fungi can produce mycotoxins, extremely dangerous compounds that can cause illness or death to humans and animals following exposure via inhalation or consumption of contaminated food. Despite what we've just seen, the number of pathogenic microorganisms is very low. In fact, more than 99% of the known bacteria, viruses, protozoa, fungi, and yeast do not cause any disease and can rather be useful instead. Many microorganisms are used in food industries, in pharmaceutical industries, and in industrial biotechnology. The four microorganisms, together with the compounds they produce, find numerous fields of application, ranging from agriculture to the production of biomaterials. Let's have a look now to some examples of beneficial bugs. For a start, we can have a look at acidic acid bacteria. Acetic acid bacteria can convert a number of carbon sources into biomolecules useful in food and beverages, chemical, medical and pharmaceutical fields. They are commonly involved in vinegar, kefir and kombucha production and can be also found in other fermented beverages like wine, beer and cider. Acidic acid bacteria can transform alcohols and sugars to produce a number of compounds that can be used in pharmaceutical industry. Lactic acid bacteria are mainly used in the production of fermented dairy products like yogurts, meat and vegetable foods, but also sourdough. They are also used for bread fermentation to improve its properties and shelf life and to delay bread staling. And here we are with filamentous fungi that we normally eat. Penicillium roqueforti is used for the production of a number of blue-veined cheeses like Stilton, Roquefort and Gorgonzola. Thanks to the production of enzymes, this fungus is involved in cheese ripening and flavor production. Likewise, Penicillium camemberti is the main ripening fungus found on the surface of soft cheeses such as camembert and brie. In 1928, Alexander Fleming realized that a mold later identified as Penicillium chrysogenium, was capable of killing a wide range of harmful bacteria. His assistants Stuart Craddock and Friedrich Reitley managed to isolate and purify the molecule responsible for this activity, penicillin, and so the era of antibiotics began. Fungi, as well as bacteria, can be used as agents of biological control to overcome the use of harmful pesticides. The secretion of metabolites with biological activity and the competition for space and nutrients with other pathogens leads to a reduction of pests and consequently to an healthy pet. What about yeast? Thanks to the ability to ferment sugars and produce ethanol and carbon dioxide, 
Yeast predominates in most of the traditional fermented foods and beverages that are present in human diet. No leavening of bread or pizza would take place without yeasts of the species Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and no beer or wine would be obtained if yeasts didn't use grape sugars and barely maltose to produce ethanol and a large part of the flavors typical of these beverages. We have now realized what single microorganisms can do. Together, in a community, in a mm -hmm. microbiome, they can be stronger, more powerful and useful. It is a united with stand, divided with fall situation. This figure tell us that every aspect of our lives is part of a unique whole. Therefore, our health is strictly connected to the environment health and to the health of all the animals that share the plant with us. It is thus extremely important to find a way to recover what has been damaged or destroyed, and the microbial communities will help us in this. A good microbiome is capable of remediating and restoring polluted sites. Bioremediation is an interesting approach that has a lot of potential and that has been already applied for the treatment of contaminated sites. Selected bacteria and fungi can together use and transform dangerous compounds like petroleum, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, industrial solvents, pesticides, plastics, and metals. In light of a sustainable agriculture, fungi and bacteria can be used as fertilizers and, as we have already seen, as biological control agents and bioremediators. Microorganisms can also be exploited to produce biofuels. Microalgae are good candidates for production of biodiesel that so far rely on vegetable oil. Also, bioethanol is a good alternative and is produced through microbial fermentation of sugars and starches derived from agricultural and forestry residues. Microorganisms are also an alternative source of nutrients. Microalgae are rich in proteins, carbohydrates, fatty acids, minerals, and vitamins. Marmite, a spreadable cream so popular in the UK, is made of yeast extract, also rich in proteins and group B vitamins. While corn is rich of mycoproteins derived from the filamentous fungus, Fusarium venenatum. Not only microorganisms like fungi are used to create biomaterials and eco leather to make up shoes and clothes, but altogether they are an extraordinary source of bioactive molecules and useful enzymes. And finally, this is the BIQ house located in Hamburg. The first experimental building powered entirely by microalgae. Bioreactors are based on microalgae that, through the photosynthesis, produce all the biomass and energy necessary to power the building. The direct exposure to the sun increases the growth of microalgae, increasing in turn the quantity of energy produced. For all these reasons, it is necessary to conserve microbial diversity. And please do remember, to take care of it means that you care about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So this was a video that was prepared by Anna. Um, so I hope uh, everybody um, had something to take from it and of course this video will also be available on the ISMIRI website so uh, 
it can be reviewed later. Now, um, I think we got to a um, somewhat fun <laughs> uh, part of the, the um, webinar. So we will have um, a, a quiz and hopefully um, it will be um, something interesting. So I'm going to launch a poll. Uh, the quiz, the rules are very, very simple. Um, we simply launch um, one question, everybody answers. You have 15 to um, 30 seconds to answer each question. They are not very difficult. And after each question is answered, we will uh, show you the results. Uh, so they are anonymous. So do not, you don't have to worry about names being shown. And um, uh, after that, our experts, uh, so, at the moment, we have not only uh, Julia and Anna, but we also have Christina, Marwa, and also other members of the, I, the IS Mary Twenty One project, and they will uh, discuss it with you. So um, hopefully, this uh, this will be fun. And I'm going to launch uh, the first question now. And um, hopefully, it will be good. Uh, here we go. So we have 15 to 30 seconds to answer the first question, which is who is the father of microbiology? Um, I see that many people are joining us still. We are admitting people. So please do feel free, those of you who have just joined us, to play um, and uh, answer the questions. Okay, so um, we end the poll now. And I will share the results. So a majority um, say Antoine, and followed by Louis, uh, followed by Robert, and followed by Edward. Um, Julia, Christina, <laughs> Anna, uh, Marwa, would you like to say something? I say that we are great, uh, a great audience, uh, because uh, most of them uh, give the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Julia? Yes, indeed. And those that didn't, that indicated Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, Finally, they are not that wrong because they are not considered the father of microbiology, but they indeed did very important discoveries in microbiology. So we will see that later in my presentation. Yes. So well done. <laughs> very good. Yes, indeed. Uh, all of them, uh, all of these scientists contributed to microbiology in one way or the other. Um, so uh, thank you. And the correct answer is number three, Antoine. And uh, now we go to the second uh, question. Uh, okay, here we go. We launch the poll and here it starts, 15 to 30 seconds. Think outside the box. Okay, um, the numbers are still changing, although we are close to 45 seconds. All right, I think now they have stopped, so I will stop the polling. And here we go, and I'll share the results. Um, so, um, which is the largest uh, living organism on Earth, blue whale? Uh, a colony of lamentous fungus, pop, uh, populous food, <laughs> microalgal colony. So the highest number we have is for the last one, uh, microalgal colony. Christina, would you like to say something? Yeah, I say that I'm sorry. Uh, in, indeed, I'm really very happy since I'm a macologist, uh, but the largest organism uh, in our planet uh, is a colony of fungus. Uh, 
Armillaria solidipes, which are widespread in woods in USA for about six square kilometers below the soil level. So the largest organism is a fungus. The second largest organism is a, a tree woods, a populus woods, again in USA. And the third largest organism is uh, the blue whale. All right. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, now we go to the third question. All right. Launching the poll, and here we go. How many of the known microorganisms are pathogens? So this is an estimation. Okay. Um, all right, so here we go. Polling, we share the results. So we have um, the highest number is the 1%, followed by 10, uh, followed by 20, followed by 50%. Um, anyone would like to say something? Yeah, I just want to add that they, they take care of the video because this message was delivered in the video and around 1% of the, the microorganism we already known could be considered in some way pathogens. So a very low amount of microbes can be dangerous for us. Um, now we got to the fourth question. Um, Here we go, and again, I think think outside the box, <laughs> and of course, um. This is open for discussion, so. Okay, so maybe we'll give people a little more time for this question um, so they can think a little longer. Yes, okay. All right, so um, seems like the numbers have stopped. Um, now end and share the results. Um, Christina, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that uh, indeed most of the answer could be right in some way uh, because many microorganisms can be unicellular or multicellular, but are also complex organisms. I would like to explain a little bit more this concept. Uh, uh, for the uh, for many eukaryotic uh, uh, microorganisms, like for example uh, fungi, we already know that uh, the uh, hyphae host inside uh, the cytoplasm endobacteria and also viruses uh, which confer different properties uh, to the organism. And the same uh, could be for some bacteria which host viruses and so on. So uh, we have to try to, to start to understand that also microbes uh, live together. Thank you. Julia? And it was very, very interesting because I saw a sort of hesitation in the beginning of people before replying because actually, yeah, we prepared a pool of um, replies, but we, we even for us, it was difficult to choose the right one because we could discuss about that uh, like uh, all day long, microbiologists, uh, even microbiologists cannot really fully choose between the different replies. So it's interesting. Well, we have one more question to go, but if this is something you would like to discuss, so 
the participants. Please just um, post it in the in the chat, and during the Q and A, we can go deeper into it. So please do feel free. Um, so the last question. Here we go. Okay, um, I think the numbers have stopped and I will stop now. Uh, share results. So, uh, Julia, this is your, uh, your yes. expertise. So, <laughs> indeed, it's true. 90% of the people gave the right uh, answer, which is that the cultural collections are very important for the preservation of microbial biodiversity. Um, actually, uh, they um, exist since 130 years, so much more, much longer than 50 years ago. They were the first culture collection created. I will explain during the presentation. And then um, the microorganisms are, uh, we can say, accessible to to the to the users, but users cannot be anyone because, for example, for the case of uh, pathogens, it, it it's required very specific uh, expertise and infrastructure to handle them. So they cannot just be uh, um, lent to everybody. And then uh, of course, uh, culture collection, they store microorganisms, but it, the, the main aim is to distribute them, to distribute to the research um, uh, society and um, to scientists. So um, I will explain later during my presentation. But well done, okay. you are well informed. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you everyone for playing along and hopefully this was also informative. Of course, if you have any uh, re questions, um, we can address them later. And now I give the floor to Julia for her presentation on uh, culture collections and their role in biodiversity. Sorry, I will share immediately my presentation. Sure, no problem. Uh -huh. So here it is. Oh, technical problems. Okay, here we are. So we have seen in the video how microorganisms are important for uh, our lives and for the ecosystem in general. And as was explained in the video, microbial biodiversity has really a key role in sustainable development. So uh, this microdiversity is preserved ex situ, it means away from the natural location, uh, by culture collection. And with this presentation, I will introduce you what are cultural collection and in which way they can help uh, store my microbial biodiversity and explore it, preserve it, and also valorize it. So let's start with some history. Uh, when were the first cultural collections born? Well, the first cultural collections were established during a period that is considered by the scientists the golden age of microbiology. Because in this period that is between 1850 and 1910, uh, there were really important discoveries in the microbiological fields. In this period, uh, they were, for example, discovered fermentation and pasteurization by uh, Louis Pasteur. And also, it's in this period that first, the first time uh, microbes were connected to uh, the specific diseases. So um, it's in 1876 that Robert Koch isolated the first uh, bacterial pathogen. And this is very important because this was the very first time that a microbial organism was isolated ever. And since then, 
many other isolates were, uh, were obtained. And this was possible also thanks to some specific technological developments, like, like for example, the development uh, of a, a solid medium to grow bac bacteria, the introduction of agar, uh, of agar plates, and also the development of techniques such as enrichment cultures. So uh, since then, many different uh, isolates were uh, obtained and as a consequence, uh, the first culture collection were born. So the first, but the first culture collection that was established specifically to preserve and distribute string to other scientists was the one of Professor Kral in Prague and it was founded around uh, 1880, the 1880s. So uh, it's only a few years later in 1904 that another culture collection was born and is the CBS, which is the Institute for Fungal Biodiversity in the Netherlands that was renamed afterwards the Westerdijk Fungal Biodiversity Institute after Joanna Westerdijk, which is the first female professor in the Netherlands and the director of the institute. The Westerdijk Institute still hosts today the largest collection of fungal biodiversity and the strains that were isolated in the end of the 19th century, they are still available for researchers. So since the beginning, the, the beginning of the 20th century, the number of cultural collections that were established in the different countries increased exponentially. And this was in parallel with the increasing number of microbial isolates. Today, more than 200, 250 public culture collections exist in Europe and more than 800 worldwide. So the cultural collections, they preserve strain that belong to very different microbial groups and that were isolated from very diverse geographic locations and habitats all around the world. So um, what we know about this great number of cultural collections, in 214, there was a survey that was run from the World uh, Federation of Cultural Collections to which 647 participants, cultural collections participated. And we now, and it was estimated by then that more than 2 million and 350 microbial strains are stored in these cultural collections. You can see here in the graph that actually um, they are distributed uh, in not, we cannot say a really even way around the world with the, the, the darkest colors of the countries represent the most abundant uh, uh, number of strains that this country uh, can, uh, is actually storing. So, Okay, uh, so what are cultural collections? Culture, cultural collections are, we can say that are to microorganisms, what the library is hard to books. But in reality, uh, cultural collections activity is not limited to storage and distribution. In fact, uh, microbiologists who work in cultural collections, they uh, are real experts in microbial biodiversity and they can carry out a lot of different um, tasks. For example, the sampling uh, task, which is to collect samples from, we can say, almost all over the world from very diverse habitats that can be very easily accessible or they can be uh, of hard access, like, for example, the poles or, or the bottom of the oceans. Then the samples are uh, brought to the laboratory where they undergo a process which goes through the cultivation and uh, the isolation for the microbes that are of interest. These uh, strains that are isolated, they are then identified in order to understand to which um, um, taxonomical group they belong to and to be able to give them a name. And then afterwards, they can be uh, added to uh, store in the culture collection and added to the catalog so they can be uh, available for distribution to the people that are interested to acquire them. The, um, my, the strain that are in the culture collections, they don't only come from the activity of the culture collections. Also, my, uh, my microbiologists that work into um, research institutes can deposit the strain into culture collections if these strains are of interest because, for example, they represent a new species or they have some particular characteristics and features. So the result of these activities that were carried out along uh, 130 years 
is a really amazing biodiversity that is always available for research and for society. But the activities of the cultural collections are changing. They are not limited to isolation, identification, preservation and distribution. Recently, cultural collections has, have started also to carry out activities that are meant to valorize the microbial diversity. And this is to increase the benefit that the society can have from the knowledge and the use of microbial biodiversity. So for example, cultural collection can provide services to support research and innovation and development. They can run tests on microbial strains in order to characterize them, for example, for some specific properties of functions. Also, they are uh, really committed to the data management and sharing. It means that they not only store the microbial isolates, but they store also all the data that are associated to this strain. And these data are, uh, meant, are, are stored to be available and to be used in the future for some specific developments in the science. And then uh, cultural collections are also committed to education and knowledge transfer. So they are involved, for example, in courses or teaching or classes uh, with the interest to uh, teach which are the best approaches to preserve and valorize microbial biodiversity. Uh, this valorization of microbial resources for the large, largest community and for the society oblige cultural collections to follow some specific rules. So they need to operate following uh, strict procedures according to the quality management system, and they need to comply with numerous rules that are uh, legal rules uh, with respect to the microbi microbiological safety and the exploitation of microbes. Did you know, for example, that in most of the world countries, it is necessary to ask for a special permit before collecting microbial resources from the natural environment. Actually, since October 2014, the rules were set by an international agreement known by Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. This protocol aims to protect the use of genetic resources, which include also microorganisms, and share the benefits that arise from their utilization in a fair and equitable way with the countries where, and the populations of the countries where these microorganisms were isolated. In this way, the Nagoya protocols contribute to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and combat the biopiracy. So, uh, which are the challenges for the preservation of microbial biodiversity in the future? Well, let's first have a look of what how can we describe microbial biodiversity? Usually and very often it's represented with the symbolic example of the iceberg, with the tip of the iceberg that uh, represents the microbial diversity that was already discovered and described, and the largest portion of the iceberg that has everybody knows is the it's underneath the surface, it represents the biodiversity that was not described yet. So the Earth Microbiome Project has catalogued around 10 million of different microbial species. And only a part of this can be actually cultured and uh, isolated and preserved in cultural collections. So 10 million of different microbial species may seem a lot, but actually it's not that much compared to what scientists have estimated to be the total microbial biodiversity. In fact, it was recently calculated that the heart is home of one trillion different microbial species. And as a consequence, we believe that we know only the 99.999% of the microbial species uh, on Earth, and these remain undiscovered. So uh, this indicates that until now, the microbiologists were able to isolate and preserve only a very tiny fraction of the microbial biodiversity. And this is mainly due to the fact that microbial species might be very difficult, if not impossible, to cultivate and isolate. In fact, some microbes require very special culturing conditions and nutrients. Also, we know that it has become clear now for scientists, for microbiologists, that some microbes do not like to live alone. They really need company. 
It is because different microbial species, when are together, they may form consortia and that are able to share some tasks for the common good. And for instance, this, uh, there is a classical example that is with, with respect to nutrients. So when we give a complex substrate to the uh, organism, um, a consortium is able to use it since uh, in the consortium there might, be, there might be one of the microbes that is able, for example, to degrade the complex substrate and to render available the different building blocks that constitute it to the other organs that live in close relation with him. And this is not possible, for example, for microorganisms that are alone. So uh, we now know that when we speak about microbes, one plus one plus one is not equal three, but much more. Together, microbes can do really amazing things. So in the last years, uh, microbiologists have started to wonder if one of the solution to be able to preserve ex situ microbial biodiversity wouldn't be to avoid the isolation of microbes and focus instead on the strategies to preserve the consortia and the microbiomes. Why it's important to uh, preserve microbiomes, we have seen that in the video because they can be used for very, very diverse applications. They can be used for ecosystem restoration, pollution remediation, for the valorization of biomass and energy production and biofuel productions. They, can, they are very useful in agriculture and food production. They are determinant for soil and plant health, animal health, but last but not least, also for human health. Is an example now, for example, the um, fecal microbiota transplantation that are applied to uh, people that uh, underwent uh, diseases in the gastrointestinal tract. So microbiomes are very important and the preservation of microbiomes is one of the major challenges that cultural collection will have to face in the near future. So the fact that together we can accomplish greater things than alone applies not only to microbes, but also to microbiologists. So now cultural collection have understood that uh, team play is very important and it's a perfect strategy to fight, to face the challenges that there will be in the future. So they have lately started to form a consortia and network. Uh, and these networks can be small ones uh, or very large ones. They can be uh, within the same country or across different countries and all around the world. And through these collaborative networks, cultural collections, they share knowledge, their expertise, their microbial resources, but also data and some technical skills and instrumentation. And they do that because they work to, like this, they can work together synergistically and together with a common scope, that is to promote the use of microbial resources and to help the transition to a green, healthy and sustainable. So this was my presentation and uh, uh, do not hesitate to ask questions and discuss with me about that. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, may I? Uh, we need to, to all mute. Um, so, if I can ask everybody to mute so there are no interruptions. Um, thank you very much, Julia. And now uh, we have a very short presentation on uh, our project and we'll go to QA. We are slightly behind uh, on time, but I hope uh, we can extend the webinar by five or so minutes. So we can have a bit of a discussion. Um, so I will share my screen now and please um, let me know if you are able to see uh, the full screen. Um, uh, Julia, could you confirm? Yes, we are. All right. So um, I will give a very short presentation on uh, the activities of IS Miri and Miri. Um, so ISMIRI21, uh, standing for Implementation and Sustainability of uh, MIRI, Microbial Resource Research Infrastructure for the 21st Century, is a Horizon 2020 project. So it's uh, funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 program. Um, and it started about uh, 
18 months ago and it will go on up to uh, January 2023, so another 18 months. And the overall aim of um, IS MIRI is to support uh, RNI, uh, research and innovation and development um, through the, by uh, facilitating access and application of uh, microbial um, resources, uh, information and techniques across Europe. So um, ISMIRI 21, um, its, it's uh, main mission is the um, installation of um, services and activities that would ensure MIRI, which is a pan-European research infrastructure, will quickly dig into that um, and in its sustainability in the long run. So how would uh, we plan to do this is first by uh, connecting different actors that um, have um, microbial uh, sources and uh, data, we will look at them as well, um, across Europe by connecting them and ensuring uh, long-term sustainability of their activities as a network. And also through this, we will look, uh, of course, we will accomplish um, the observation of biodiversity, um, the spreading of knowledge and professional development. So ISMIRI uh, 21, so uh, University of Torino, INRA and SPI, um, we are partners of this consortium. It consists of 14 partners and it is led by University of Minho from Portugal, uh, situated in Braga. And we have eight third parties in addition to the 14 partners. And out of these 22 uh, organizations across um, 10 European, um, from 10 European uh, countries, um, 20 of them are either academic institutions, institutions, CCs, uh, culture collections, or MBRCs. Um, and to the next slide, sorry. So just a, a very short background on MIRI. So MIRI is a pan-European research infrastructure. Um, and uh, the aim of MIRI is uh, to systemize investigation and usage of uh, microbial resource, resources and associated data uh, across Europe and also beyond in the future for the preservation, uh, provision and valorization of microbial uh, resources across um, across different countries and different fields. So the aim of MIRI is to defragment uh, access to um, microbial resources, strains and data um, between um, different infrastructures. So at the moment, MIRI has over 50 uh, research institutions um, and uh, CCs, MBRCs in, within this network that work together and share information data. And um, MIRI intends to, of course, expand this network, but also facilitate um, and harmonize activities and, uh, um, and um, usage of resources among these uh, members. So MIRI applied to be part of ERIC or to have the status of ERIC, which is a European Research Infrastructure Consortium in 2018. And through IS MIRI, it is progressing to actually um, attain this uh, status, hopefully by um, the end of next year, uh, before the ending of uh, IS MIRI. 21, and this will give it a legal framework in which it can work in line with European strategies and interests of the European um, RI ecosystem and the countries. Um, so MIRI's members, as I said, 50 plus uh, biorepositories, as we call them, so from Belgium, France, Greece, Italy, Latvia, Netherlands, uh, Poland, Portugal, Russia, and Spain, and Romania is an observer country moment not a recognized member and these countries are uh, those that agreed to be members of uh, MIRI by uh, signing the MOU uh, U, which is the Memorandum of Understanding. So three the, through these uh, members MIRI offers access. So through MIRI you can access um, these uh, biorepositories and their holdings comes to over 400,000 of microbial resources and data. There are state-of-the-art facilities and technological platforms, which also, of course, through MIRI, you will see in the, few, uh, in the, in the upcoming slides how uh, we will be using them in a transnational access program. Um, and also their service, services, the techniques, and expertise that come through um, their experience um, over 2,800 years of collective experience that they have had, uh, training opportunities and tailor-made and flexible cost-effective uh, solutions. Of course, MIRI is a non-profit organization. 
so the current membership of uh, MIRI, as we saw, uh, we have nine EU member states, one associated um, nation, associated nation, which is Russia, and uh, Romania, which is an observant country. And um, the CCU, or the coordinating uh, unit, uh, coordination unit of um, Amiri is situated in Braga, University of Minya at the moment, and um, the, um, and it's uh, together with Spain, Valencia. So this the CCU is divided into two uh, countries: the Portugal and Spain. And so, uh, just going back uh, to IS Miri and how it is um, installing services in order to ensure Miri's. Um, sustainability. So um, through ISME, for instance, we are establishing what we call the collaborative work environment. So this is an online platform that will give access to different users, uh, scientists, um, engineers, actors from bio industries, uh, researchers, um, also citizens in terms of information, um, where they can access all of this from one single platform. And we'll also have the transnational access program. Uh, the first, the pilot um, of uh, phase of this program was um, launched um, this year in January. And now the, this will give access uh, to MIRI's uh, resources to, to researchers from different uh, countries, in fact, from um, Africa and also Europe, I believe. Um, and these researchers will be able Dora, sorry, you're um, you're uh, muted. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, was I muted the whole time? Or no, no, no. Only the last few seconds. Okay, sorry. I, I believe uh, somehow it got muted. So, um, um, I believe I was I muted in the slide, or should I go back? No, 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 only the last few, very few seconds. All right, thank you, thank you, Julia. So, um, sorry about that. So the, the last things I said, I think it was in reference to education and training program, which is linked to the CWE. And it's of course under development at the moment under ISMIRI 21. And this will be uh, open of course to uh, all uh, uh, tertiary and above training. So it will be open to all actors in the, in the RNI uh, ecosystem. And we also are looking at enlargement of the MIRI membership um, through the IS MIRI activities, which is open to all countries, um, which meet the requirements of being a, MIRI, a member of MIRI's network. All right, so the CWE, just a quick, uh, Overlooked is one of the greatest achievements of IS MIRI 21. And this platform has uh, four gates. So um, there is gate one uh, in one way. You Through this platform, you can access information about different research, research infrastructures. And we also have a uh, gate to services, which is access to microbial resources, data, and uh, different services that the MIRI uh, partners and um, organizations members of the network offer. We also have gate to collaboration. So this is a gate where experts can come together. It's um, an expert uh, cluster um, forum, which um, different experts from IT, uh, microbiology, biotechnology can come together and discuss. And of course, membership will be uh, required in order to be part of this cluster. And we will have the gate to training and education in which different courses uh, provided either collectively or single-handedly by members of the MIRI uh, network um, to different actors. So just the final uh, slide. So how does MIRI intend to impact, uh, to have impact in the in research and innovation. It provides a wide range of resources, services, and expertise through its members. Um, it is, um, the idea is to have it coordinated, harmonized, and um, repeat, uh, um, 
uh, sorry, um, avoid redundancy and repetition and loss of resources, of course. And it's also being a MIRI's member, it also helps organizations and experts to have visibility in the international um, arena and also exchange knowledge, the opportunity to meet other actors from different backgrounds, from uh, different with different perspectives and it also plays a unique role in European scientific and um, research and innovation landscape so MIRI has three domains health um, and food uh, agrofood and energy and environmental sciences so they we will uh, provide services specifically catering to these domains or to actors that are specialized in these domains and overall through all these activities IS MIRI and MIRI intend to help the fight against societal challenges, climate change, poverty, um, many other diseases. Um, pandemic is a, one, a good example that has affected the whole world. And, um, and uh, this is uh, one of uh, the key um, aims of MIRI is to, fight, to help in the fight against these uh, societal challenges. So um, sorry if the uh, presentation went a little too long, but to get hold of us, please follow us on social um, media channels that we have, uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, uh, ResearchGate, and also we will post um, videos on our, um, you can also email us at info, uh, info at uh, miri.org and visit our website, ismiri, um, um, and also miri, but um, we can also get hold of us uh, one way or the other. Um, now we are uh, done with the presentations and we go to Q&A and we open the floor for um, everyone to ask <laughs> any questions that you might have. Um, so we have received uh, some questions. Maybe we can start by addressing, uh, by answering them. Um, please do feel feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. So um, one of the questions we have is uh, the Q&A was very interesting and fun. I would like to know more about the complex uh, organism behavior of um, microorganisms. Um, so this was sent uh, from Prasun. Uh, Prasun, would you like to unmute and, and say something? Uh, directly ask our experts. So I will try to reply in some way to Dora. Sure. Okay, uh, so as I already told you, uh, many microbes uh, live together because of uh, nutrition behavior, but also physically uh, interact uh, among each other. And I will give you two examples. One, it's related to the mycosphere concept. We already uh, know about the rhizosphere concept, uh, so that microorganisms are strictly associated to the roots of the plants. But the same is true with the hyphae um, of the fungi in soil, which uh, literally transport bacteria over the surface of the hyphae. And uh, as I already told you, host bacteria bacteria and viruses inside the hyphae and in this way they create a functional consortia which are really uh, effective for example in bioremediation. Uh, so we always think that bacteria, fungi and viruses uh, live uh, uh, in distinct ways but this is really not true in natural environments. Uh, just another very famous example, many years ago uh, there was a, a plant uh, which uh, uh, has been studied in detail because it was able to grow uh, on the border of geyser and uh, it was thermotolerant and when uh, uh, the scientists uh, tried to investigate uh, the reason of this, uh, they understood uh, that the plant hosted a fungus, uh, which was uh, at, at the beginning uh, considered the responses uh, of the um, uh, uh, heat tolerance. But then they discovered that the fungus host viruses uh, uh, inside, uh, which uh, was the re uh, real uh, responsible for uh, resistance uh, to hot, uh, high temperatures. So a tree repartite symbiosis, uh, we want to um, describe uh, this system in this way. 
So please, the final message is uh, uh, consider that also microbes uh, uh, interact each other physically and metabolically, and then interact with the other organism in this way. I hope I, it's clear. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Um, yes, um, so uh, there is one question. How can we share and correlate our microbiome data uh, within MIRI project? Um, Julia, do you, do you have an answer to this? Well, I guess that the reply from Basem is the best because at present to share the data is something we are really uh, working on. So like uh, Tedora was explaining, uh, we are building this uh, very large uh, collaborative work environment uh, where uh, that will help uh, not only to uh, store the data and the information, but also to um, give access and exchange this data with uh, different users. So uh, this is, I'm actually actively involved in the ES MIRI 21 project, but actually this is not my field of expertise. So if you want to choose to share, if you're interested to share, then you should really come to our address and we will put you in contact with the real experts that take care of this data sharing and building of this uh, cloud system. Thank you, Julia. Um... Yes, uh, we have shared the email address, so please do feel free to uh, contact us. So um, we don't have any more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, maybe um, we see if uh, there's anybody who, have, who would like to say something uh, from our audiences. Okay, we just received one more question. So, um, hello, um, I am just curious how we can harvest uh, microalgae uh, so that we uh, use them as bioreactors. Do we use their oil? What are some of the components in the oil that fuels energy? Okay, this is a very applied question. Well, how can we harvest microalgae? Uh, most of the time, uh, microalgae, when they are meant to be used for energy purposes, they are not simply harvested from the environment, but they are grown into uh, reactor systems, very large ones. Uh, then they are, of course, harvested with many different techniques, depending on the kind of microalgae. And very often, the biotechnological process selects the uh, microalgal strain and the growing system to be able to maximize the amount of, for example, polyunsaturated fatty acids that they produce, that it can be used, for example, afterwards to produce biofuels. But these are very, very specific and applied uh, things, aspects. And uh, we have in MIRI, in, um, in our consortium, a group that works with microalgae biotechnology so if you really are interested to have more information, you can write to us and we can put you in contact with them. This is the cultural collection BEA that works in the Canary Islands in Spain. Thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, do you have any follow-up questions, uh, Shane, um, or anyone would like to say something? I'm myself, Shirojit Pan, I'm from India. And I have few doubts in my mind, like uh, like the current scenario, as we must be observing nowadays, it's like it's COVID time and the doctors, they are prescribing antibiotics so much. And as we must be all aware of this, antibiotic resistant has become a major threat nowadays. So why can't we start promoting probiotics and prebiotics in a alternative to, you know, like the traditional antibiotics therapy? And if it is happening, so what could be the strategy to, one should come up with and that would help us to address the few fundamental things and that in terms we can promote the microbiomes in our society as well. I'm not 
not sure if I really catch your question about uh, antimicrobial resistant crisis uh, in the world. Um, if I write understood, you are asking uh, how we can avoid uh, the use of antibiotic uh, in, in many um, occasions. Is it true? Uh, exactly. I just like, uh, like I'm a researcher and uh, currently I'm working in Central University of Kerala. And like our idea is to promote probiotics as a promising alternative to the antibiotics treatment modality. So like what, what in what extent we can start with, like is, will it be fine if we could confine a single dose of antibiotics and we can, pro, like we can, you know, like we can make a synergy concentration with antibiotics and the pro 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 probiotics and will that be okay? Like, I just want your opinion on that. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's a good strategy just to address uh, the challenge uh, by different point of view. So to select new microbe, microbes for the, the production of new uh, antibiotics uh, and in the same time uh, avoid uh, to use as much as possible the previous one uh, which uh, show resistance. But we have to keep in mind that uh, the problem is mainly related uh, to the um, animal uh, fields, uh, because we already know that uh, most of the antibiotics uh, are using vet fields. So we have to change also not only the use uh, of probi probiotics uh, in uh, human life, but also in, uh, in the animal farms, uh, because vets is the main way of release uh, of uh, bacteria which are resistant to antibiotic. So you exactly. are in, 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 in the perfect uh, moods uh, to address the challenge. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christina. Uh, do we have uh, more questions? Um, all right, should you like to... Okay, uh, so we have for Christina, thank you so much for the details. I'm curious how to isolate micro uh, microbes if they live as a complex organism uh, in case uh, um, they survive together, not as an independent entity, how to maintain their culture. I can give you some example in our culture collection. For example, uh, we have uh, many fungi which host mycoviruses uh, and uh, uh, we cure the fungi to uh, maintain different kinds of viruses uh, inside them. So we are also able to understand uh, which is the effect uh, on the fungal phenotype uh, according to the different kind of viruses. Uh, this is, uh, for example, also biotechnological application because uh, together with our colleagues, uh, we have already been able to uh, move some microviruses to plant, uh, for example, to confer uh, salinity, stress control to plant. Uh, so we are indeed able right now to preserve not all these complex systems, but we are uh, learning step by step. And as Julia told uh, in her presentation, uh, now MIRI partners are evolving to new culturomic approaches. So to try to cultivate uh, axenic uh, microbes uh, culture, but also consortia of microbes, uh, uh, which are really uh, um, very important uh, if we want to depict uh, the vast majority of uh, microbial biodiversity. Uh, Julia, Anna, Marwa, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, the, the only thing I would like to add is that in this case, well, when we speak about isolates, it's, it can be really standardized. So the same medium can be used for many different isolates. When we start to work with the consortia, for example, the tricky part is that you really have to tailor the environment, so the nutrients, uh, the culturing system and so on, to your specific system. So, and there is not much research at the moment to be able to have like common uh, conditions for, for consortia. This is really under development. So if you really want to keep your consortium, then you really need to dedicate a lot of time. It's a big challenge to develop the system that it's better for them to be able to grow together. 
And, but this is only the beginning. We can imagine that in the future, as many people are going in this, into this direction, there will be more information and then we will be able to do that in a more um, easy way and it will become routine, hopefully. But someone has to start somewhere. Julia, if I may add a sentence on this, uh, uh, I think that one of the mistakes of the traditional uh, microbiologists uh, is to use uh, only the traditional media to grow uh, microbes. On the other hand, if you try to mimic as much as possible the natural environment, you are isolating microbes, uh, you will be much more successful in isolating a vast majority of microbes. So it's a simple suggestion, but uh, in addition to the traditional media, please try to mimic as much as possible uh, the natural environment you are working on, creating your own media. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, do we have a follow-up question? Um, Rasmus? All right, um, so um, let's see if we have any more questions. If not, uh, we will um, start closing. Um, so uh, free uh, to send in the chat or speak up, but um, I would like to say that um, thank you very much for joining us. And we have a very uh, short anonymous survey. Uh, it's um, two, three minutes, uh, just to have an idea of how this um, session helped you, uh, what you found to be most beneficial and how we can, um, what kind of topics we can address in the future. Um, similar events that we will be launching on behalf of IS MIRI 21 and MIRI. Um, so please feel free to fill it in now, uh, later on. Um, it will only take a few minutes. And um, if we don't have any more questions, we will, we will close. But before we close, may I ask if, uh, if you are all comfortable for us to take uh, one screenshot. Uh, so if we can all uh, share our uh, video um, and, uh, and I will take uh, the screenshot. Of course, only if you are comfortable. <laughs> All right, so um, the first one goes. Thank you. And I will take the second one as well. Um, uh, actually, it's three pages. And yes, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we hope this, this session was helpful um, and informative. If you have any follow-up questions, any doubts in the future, please uh, do uh, send an email to info at miri.org. Uh, we will um, either uh, forward your question to our experts who are specialized in that area, sorry about the noise, um, or we will um, directly uh, answer it for you. And um, have a very uh, good um, Sunday. And uh, yes, and of course, uh, I just saw one question. Yes, we do offer um, uh, certificates. So we do provide those. Uh, please um, write uh, an email to uh, Theodora at Aibu. So I'm writing it down in the, in the chat if you would like to receive a certificate of participation. And um, that's PT. And 